In this video, we will discuss how the straight chain form of D-glucose can be converted to the cyclic structure, which is commonly shown while uh, drawing the condensation reactions between two or more monosaccharides. So here I have drawn the straight chain structure of D-glucose. I have numbered the carbon atoms in green from 1 to 6, so that later on when I draw the cyclic structure, it will be easier for you to identify the carbon atoms. Now, this straight chain form is also known as the Fischer projection. It is uh, also called as the Fischer projection. So in order to convert the straight chain structure to the cyclic structure, first we need to activate the aldehyde group that is present in this molecule. And we can do that by placing this molecule in an acidic solution, which of course contains a lot of H plus ions. Now, remember that this oxygen in the carbonyl group is highly electronegative. So it will pull the positively charged H plus ion towards itself and hence get protonated. And also remember that this H plus ion is just a proton. It does not have any electrons. So there will be an overall positive formal charge on this oxygen. Now let's try to draw the basic ring of the cyclic structure based on what we know. So we'll start from the right side from the first carbon and we'll go to the left and slowly towards the top. And we'll stop at the fifth carbon. This is the fifth carbon we stop here. Now let's try to label these carbon atoms um, based on what we did in the straight chain structure. So this is the first carbon. This is the second is the third, this is the fourth, and this is the fifth carbon. Now, before we move to the fifth carbon, first let's complete the bonds of the rest of the carbon atoms. So the first carbon atom is just part of the aldehyde group. So we can um, draw that. Here we have the aldehyde group with the H and the double bond O. And this oxygen was um, protonated, so it has a bond to a hydrogen atom and a formal positive charge. The second carbon has an H and an OH. The third carbon has the same but in the opposite direction. So we will put the H downwards and the OH upwards. But when you go to the fourth carbon atom, we're back to the same direction again. So OH at the bottom and H at the top. Now, when it comes to the fifth carbon atom, we need to consider something. So on this left-hand side diagram, you can see this fifth carbon atom is bonded to a hydroxyl group, a hydrogen atom, and a CH2OH group. Now, these three groups need to be arranged in a specific order, in a specific manner in this ring. Now, this CH2OH will be going upwards like this. This is the CH2OH. The hydrogen atom will be going downwards, which leaves us with the hydroxyl group that will be projected to the right. Now remember earlier in this video, I said that the oxygen in the carbonyl group is highly electronegative, which means it will pull the bond pairs of electrons away from this carbon atom towards itself. Hence, this oxygen has a partial negative charge and this carbon has a partial positive charge. Now, in this hydroxyl group that is bonded to the fifth carbon atom, this oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons. It has six electrons in its outer shell. Uh, it uses one electron to bond with this hydrogen and the other electron it uses to bond with this carbon atom. So it's left with two lone pairs and these two lone pairs will attack the partially positive carbon atom here and try to react with it. Now, oxygen with a positive formal charge is highly unstable. It is against the nature of oxygen to have a positive charge. So it will try to get rid of it as fast as possible. And to do that, it will pull the pi electrons towards itself. And now this pi bond breaks and we can um, close the ring. I'll show you how we close the ring here. I'll cut this part off and I'll draw it. Now as this uh, 
pi bond is gone here, only the sigma bond is remaining. So that will just be a single bond to the oxygen. And the hydrogen here, we can just write it beside the oxygen as OH. And of course, the positive formal charge is gone. And the hydrogen, this hydrogen here, can be just written in the standard way at the bottom as H. Now, the attack of this oxygen to this carbon has been successful. And now carbon has three bonds because it was double bonded before. So the double bond is gone. It's just a single bond now. So it has the ability to form an extra bond. So this oxygen will form a bond with the carbon. So this is our uh, Hayworth projection. Um, here it's, this is the Hayworth projection. And this hydrogen here, uh, this extra hydrogen that is here, uh, actually from the, in the solution, there will be water molecules. So a water molecule will just pull this hydrogen away from the OH group to form the um, hydronium ion. So we can erase this, oxy uh, erase this hydrogen here. So now there is one more thing that you need to remember and that's that after the mechanism takes place the OH can also go downwards and the H can also go upwards. There will be some molecules with that configuration as well. So the H will be at the top and the OH will be at the bottom. Now the form where the OH is at the top and the H is at the bottom is known as the uh, alpha form. This is the alpha glucose or alpha D glucose and the um, and the configuration where OH is at the bottom and H is at the top is known as the beta form which is beta glucose. Now these two forms are interchangeable that means in solution they can change from one form to another. Now pure alpha glucose has the ability to bend plane polarized light at an angle of 112.2 degrees whereas pure beta glucose has the ability to bend plain polarized light at an angle of 18.7 degrees now if you put pure alpha glucose in a solution or pure beta glucose in a solution and allow it to reach dynamic equilibrium you will find at equilibrium that the overall bending of plain polarized light is 52.7 degrees and this angle is closer to that of beta glucose than the alpha glucose. So as the beta form is more favored than the alpha form, it also means that the beta form is more stable and it is backed by the relative abundance of these two forms. So about 64% of all D glucose is existing in the beta form. Whereas approximately 36% of all D glucose exists in the alpha form.